For the Jews require or demand a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's just as true today as it was when Paul wrote it. And I will offer this comment. I don't believe we really have a right to offer the Jews a gospel which is not supernaturally attested. I won't go into that, but I don't think there's any New Testament basis for it. For the Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. What do we preach? Christ, Not just Christ. It's easy to preach Christ as the great teacher and the wonderful healer, but it doesn't get the job done. We have to preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, still is today. And to the Greeks foolishness, still is today. But, thank God for the but, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. When do we find Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God? Only when we've come to the end of our own power and our own wisdom. And then Paul makes this marvelous statement. The foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In one word, what is the foolishness of God and what is the weakness of God? The cross, that's right. It's the ultimate in weakness. You can't think of anything more totally weak than a man dying in agony on a cross, breathing his last. And it's totally foolish that God should send his son, the one perfect man, into the world and then allow him to die a criminal's death. So it's totally weak and totally foolish. But when we come to the right point in our lives, when we come to the end of all our cleverness and all our wisdom and all our strength and all our righteousness, then we make this wonderful discovery that it's stronger than man's strength and wiser than man's wisdom. And again, I have to say, because of my background in Greek philosophy, I find these words totally true. They're not an exaggeration. They're exactly correct. This is the way it is. In the cross, God's weakness is stronger than our strength, and God's foolishness is wiser than our wisdom. But it's hard for most of us, or is it, to let go our strength and to let go our wisdom. We want to cling on to it. We saw a very beautiful little religious skit here where the young woman was offered a beautiful new garment in place of her shabby old coat. She was willing to get the garment, but she was very unwilling to let go of her own shabby old coat. And that's how it is with many of us. Well, I want God's wisdom. I want God's strength. But I still want to hold on to my own, too. God does not deal on that basis. You have to come to the end of your own wisdom and your own strength before God will release his grace into your life. Paul makes some amazing statements along this line. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, have you ever noticed that a lot of people today are busy with 1 Corinthians because it's got all the gifts of the Spirit, etc.? But not many people spend much time in 2 Corinthians. You know why? Because its theme is weakness and suffering. <laughs> And that's not a popular theme. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 7. Paul is speaking from personal experience. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. He's been speaking about all the revelations God has given. And you know what revelations tend to do? They tend to make us proud. And Paul and God loved Paul so much that he guarded against pride in a very unusual way, by releasing an angel of Satan to follow him round from place to place and stir up trouble and persecution and keep him humble. How many of you want to be humble? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, praise God, I'm glad you do, but you may be surprised at the means that God will use. This is what he says. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. This is a metaphor taken from the Old Testament. 
where Joshua warned the children of Israel that if they didn't eliminate the Canaanites that had occupied the land, but if they let them coexist, they would be thorns in their flesh. And you see, a lot of us have got thorns in our flesh of our own making because we've come into the promised land, but we've let a lot of Canaanites hang around. One of the things that God is teaching Ruth and me is we have to eliminate the Canaanites. But this was not something that Paul was himself responsible for. This was something God did in his life. He says, a messenger, but the word is angel. You know, the same word in Greek means angel and messenger. A thorn in the flesh was given me, a, an angel of Satan to buffet me, to keep beating me, lest I be exalted above measure. You see, if you study the career of Paul, he was unlike any of the other apostles. They all were persecuted. They all had trouble, but Paul's troubles were in a category by themselves. I mean, there was hardly a city he went to where there wasn't a riot. I mean, the most ridiculous things would provoke a riot. In Philippi, all he did was cast a demon out of a fortune-telling slave girl, and the whole city was in an uproar, and within a few hours, he and Silas were in the maximum security jail. That's not logical. You can't explain that on any process of reasoning. But there was that angel stirring things up against Paul. And basically wherever he went, things got stirred up. Uh, with Paul it was usually a riot or a revival or both. I have to say, I think the church needs more riots in order to have some more revivals. Anyhow, we've got to not go into that. Then Paul says, well, everybody knows God answers the prayers of apostles, doesn't he? I mean, surely. But Paul says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And God wouldn't. I tell people sometimes when they say God doesn't answer my prayers, remember no is also an answer. And God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's really true. Because when we have our own strength, how can people identify God's strength? They can't see it. But when we've come to the end of our own strength, and then we have strength, then we know it's God's. God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Would you like to say that? God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. So from now on you'll be happy to be weak. Is that right? Uh, I tell you, God heard, they heard you saying that. You, about six months from now, you may be sorry you ever listened to me. <laughs> Therefore, now listen, I talk a lot about confession, you've heard me talk, but I never ask people to make this confession. It took me years to come to the place where I was willing to make it myself. Listen to what Paul says. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, listen to these words, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I would not ask anybody here to make that confession, because once you made it, you've committed yourself to something. I have come to the place where, on my good days, I'm prepared to make that confession. But just think, I take pleasure, not I tolerate, not I endure, not I suffer with grace, but I take pleasure in infirmities, in weaknesses, in distresses, distresses in persecutions, in needs. Why? Because he had learned this secret. When we've come to the end of our own strength, our own wisdom, our own resources, then God releases his grace. I have a phrase which I use, which is, grace begins where human ability ends. You don't qualify for the grace of God as long as you can do it yourself. Why should God release his grace? But when you've come to the place where you can't do it, and yet it has to be done, then you qualify for the release of God's grace. Let's look at Galatians 2.20. This is another confession of Paul. 
It's interesting to notice how many times Paul himself confessed his faith and his stand. And I challenge you to search the New Testament and find any negative confession ever made by any of the apostles. I don't believe you can find it. What a pattern. And then you walk through the contemporary church, including its ministers, and you hear almost nothing but negative confessions. I can't do this. I don't feel like this. I wish. I couldn't. I can't. That's not the way the apostles talked. Not because they were self-confident, but because they'd come to the end of their own strength. And so Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, as a result of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, I've come to the end of my life. When I came to the cross, Paul died. And now it's not Paul who is living, but Christ who is living in me. Now I could challenge you to make that confession. If you're willing. Uh, don't, don't blame me. I don't say it if you don't want. But let those of us that are ready to say that, let's say it. I am crucified with Christ. Crucified. Nevertheless I live. And yet not I but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And you see, I noticed I changed from the New King James to the Old King James, which is the literal translation, by the faith of the Son of God. So it's not my faith I'm relying on, because when Jesus comes in, he comes in with his faith. Now, I believe this is the key to New Testament holiness, which is, I think you'll agree, in the contemporary church, very little is said about holiness in most corners. But the Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, holiness consisted in keeping a set of very complicated rules. Now, at the end of one of the chapters of Numbers, God says, be holy, for I am holy. In the first epistle of Peter, the first chapter, Peter quotes that statement and says, be holy, for I am holy, speaking in the person of God. But there's a total difference. New Testament holiness is not keeping a set of rules. Did I communicate that? New Testament holiness is not achieved by keeping a set of rules. New Testament holiness is achieved by dying and letting Christ live out his life through you. So it's not I, but Christ. I say it this way. It's not struggling, but yielding. It's not effort, but union. Union with Christ. I always think of a little story about a godly lady somewhere who was admired for her holy life. And one day some, uh, some other Christian said to her, Sister so-and-so, how do you deal with temptation? And she said, when the devil knocks at the door, I just let Jesus answer. <laughs> that says it in a nutshell. Not I, but Christ. Not what I can do, not my best efforts, not flexing all my spiritual muscles, but yielding. Letting Christ do it in me and through me and for me. There's that picture in John 15 of the vine and the branches which illustrates this so perfectly. John 15 verse 1 and then verses 4 and 5. Jesus says, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Let me pause there for a moment and offer an observation. Don't let human beings prune you. Okay? There's only one person who's got the skill and the sensitivity to do the pruning. That's the father. Let him do it. Okay? There are, there are some fellowships where 
the leaders want to prune you. Do not, do not submit to human pruning because it will be painful and they'll probably cut off the wrong things. <laughs> oh, I mean, I've learned this from experience. I'm not sharing theory. God the Father is the vine dresser. He's the one who knows how to prune. And our business as ministers and leaders of God's people is not to do the pruning. It's to help people to submit to God's pruning and share the process with them. Anyhow, going on, Jesus says in verses 4 and 5 of John 15, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Notice the picture. Have you ever seen a vine branch really struggling to bring forth fruit? Making good resolutions? Doesn't happen, does it? Why does it bring forth fruit? Because the life of the vine is flowing into the branch. In that little parable you have all three persons of the Godhead. The Father is the vine dresser, Jesus is the vine, and the Holy Spirit is the sap. And as he flows through the vine into the branches, you bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. See, the very word fruit tells us it's not by effort. No tree has ever brought forth fruit by a lot of effort. And no Christian can bring forth fruit by effort. We have to come to the place where we cease from our struggling and in a certain sense cease from all our good works. Not just our sins, but the things we think we can do. Come to an end and yield to Jesus. Then we can say what Paul said. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Matter of fact, I've been saying this to myself all day because I didn't feel qualified to teach this message. For me, teaching the cross is the most challenging of all subjects. But in Philippians 4.13, after Paul has been through all these processes I'm describing, please note, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now there's a better text, which we won't go into, which leaves out Christ. And this is the Prince version. I can do all things through the one who empowers me within. I can't go into the reasons for that translation, but I, I believe it's good. Maybe it would be good for us if we just took a deep breath, relaxed, and said, I can do all things through the one who empowers me within. Let's say it again. I can do all things through the one who empowers me within. So that's why we need the cross. The second reason, because only the cross releases the grace of God. You can have all the rules and all the principles and all the teaching, but you can't do it unless the grace of God is released through the cross. In fact, the more rules you get, if you don't know how to release the grace of God, the worse your problems will become. And in the end, you're likely to throw it all overboard and say, well, no good, I just can't do it. You're perfectly right. You can't do it, I can't do it. There's only one person who can do it, and his name is? That's right. But when he is allowed to live out his life in us, when we've submitted to the cross and come to the end of ourselves, then he's abundantly able to do it. And if we don't do it perfectly right the first time, he doesn't reject us. He says, you made a good try. This is where you went wrong. Now let's do it again. And he's so patient. I've been a Christian 48 years now. When I think of all the mistakes I've made, in all the ways I've gone wrong, I'm just amazed that God still keeps his hand on me. I want to tell you, if you've not been a Christian as long as I have, don't despair. He may deal with you severely. 
He may correct you. He may do things in your life that you just don't understand. But he'll never give up on you. Some of you have probably got rather bitter memories of your childhood and of parents who didn't understand you or weren't loving. Just bear in mind you've got another father now and his name is God. And he is very patient and very understanding and very gentle. But at the same time he means everything he says. All right, one more reason. This is the third reason why we need the cross. It's through the cross that the supernatural confirmation of God is released for the message we preach. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. We've read them already. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Somewhere else, Paul quotes one of his critics, and he had his critics, and the critic says, his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So Paul was not a great orator. Actually, if there was an orator among the apostles, I think it was Peter. Peter really had a flow of language. You read his two epistles and the language is tremendous. But Paul, generally speaking, it's believed he was rather short and he had bow legs and he was very unimpressive. And he didn't rely on his eloquence or his wisdom. He relied on one thing above all others the supernatural confirmation of the Holy Spirit to the message that he brought. You see that? And again, brothers and sisters, it usually doesn't work till we've come to the end of all our methods. When we've come to the end and we've got no more cards to play and we still maintain our confession, God begins to release the supernatural. Let me, I never finished the verse, so let me go in. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Notice that the Holy Spirit can be demonstrated. He himself is invisible, but he's demonstrated by what he does. You can't see him but you can see the signs and the miracles that he performs. And that's God's own attestation of the message preached. And then Paul says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Again, because of my background, I appreciate that verse. Because the philosophy that I studied, which was very fashionable 50 years ago, is right out of date today. If I had built my life on that, I would have a crumbling foundation today. But when I met Jesus, I had an experience of the supernatural power of God in my own life that has seen me through till now. I'd like to read the words of Paul in Romans chapter 15. Romans the 15th chapter. Verses 18 and 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. He said, I'm only interested in what Christ has done through me. I'm not interested in what I've done on my own. To make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Without the signs and wonders, we have not fully preached. We've preached, but we haven't fully preached. Now, i just take a few moments to illustrate this. In the late 1950s, I was principal of a college for training teachers in Kenya, in East Africa. At that time, the Africans were striving for education. So they were willing to go to a college and they were willing to obey all the rules and do everything we said. If we said get baptized, they would be baptized. If they said sing hymns, they would sing hymns. Because their future lay in that. But after I'd been about a year or so, I realized that most of it was external conformity for the sake of education. 
there was very little of real heart obedience. So one day I summoned the student body together, about 120, and I said, uh, I want to thank you for the way you cooperate with us and the way you do what we tell you to do. And I realize you do it because your education depends on it. And I'm grateful. But I said, in the minds of most of you, there's a big unanswered question. And the unanswered question is this. Is the Bible really a message from God or is it a white man's book that doesn't apply to Africans? And they sat up because that's exactly what they were thinking. Then I said something that shocked them. I said, what's more, I can't answer that question. There's only one way you can find out the answer for yourself. That is, if you have a, an experience of the supernatural power of God in your life, then you'll know it didn't come from America and it didn't come from Britain. It came from heaven. So I, I left them. I put the word of God before them in every way I could because I had the authority. And I went away and prayed for about six months. And then God poured out his spirit on those students. And we couldn't get them to sleep at night in the dormitories. They were so busy praying. And in the next, next six months, we had all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation amongst those young Africans. And you see, the attitude of the, of the missionaries at that time, let me be careful what I say, was you can't lift Africans very high. They'll just come so high, that's as high as you can get them. If you're dealing in the natural, that's probably true. But in the supernatural, thank God, everybody has the same rights and qualifications. And... Uh, I would have to say that their lives were radically changed when they experienced God's supernatural power. During that period, we saw two persons raised from the dead. Two of my students. One was a young man, the other was a young woman. I think I can briefly relate the story of the young woman. She became extremely sick, did what all Africans do when they're sick, went home to her village, then her brother came on a bicycle one day and said, uh, Teresa is very, very sick. She's dying. So my first wife and I, Lydia, got in the car, put the bicycle on the roof of the car, took a long journey, had to wade a stream, arrived at the village, and there she was in a little clinic, apparently dead. It was just like a scene in the New Testament. The family was all outside, moaning and weeping. And Lydia and I walked in, we didn't have any plans, but we just knelt down on either side of the bed and prayed. And after a moment, she sat up, well, more than a moment, quite a while. And she said, has anyone got a Bible? So I said, yes. She said, read Psalm 42, 41. I did. We didn't know why, but when she died, her spirit left her body. It went to a place that she said was full of beautiful bright lights and there was a man reading the Bible and he was reading Psalm 41. So she wanted to know what was in Psalm 41. And uh, believe me, that creates obedience from the heart. There is one other message in this series. For further teaching on this theme, we recommend the following cassettes. How to Become a New Creation, number B4066, and the album, The World, The Cross, and The Church, number IWCC1. For further information and a resource guide containing all audio and video cassettes and books, please contact Derek Prince Ministries, Box 19501, Department T, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28219, telephone 704-357-3556.